Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the 505. And as always, it's great having everyone here, uh, both in person and those who are joining us online. Trust me, those who are joining us online, I don't know which camera to look at. <laughs> we have two cameras, and I don't know which is switched. I don't know if it's the big Canon or the little PTZ, but welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, just before we get going, make sure you fill out that connection card. As always, fill out that connection card and uh, fill it out anytime. And for those in person, they have prayer requests on the back. You can fill that out. I will promise you I will gather those later on uh, during um, the service. Uh, I promise, because I have one myself that I'm gonna hold on to right there. And uh, those who are joining us uh, online, just fill out that link. It's a uh, click right below the YouTube feed and record your presence here with all of us. Well, we are here to celebrate the goodness of God, his grace uh, to us in Jesus Christ. And so let's rise as we begin our worship in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I love 
Brothers and sisters in Christ, let's join together in prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, so thankful that your arms are open wide, welcoming us into your presence through the wide open arms of your son Jesus on the cross and then standing outside the empty tomb with his arms open wide, welcoming us into his new life into his grace, into his forgiveness. Such good news to hear, Lord, and it is this, this kindness in Jesus Christ, that is what leads us to repentance. It is when we recognize our sinfulness, recognize that apart from Jesus, we are dead in our sins and trespasses, and that we are destined for destruction. But through Jesus, he has opened up the gates of paradise, all through his shed blood, through his death and resurrection. So Lord God, at this time, we're going to confess our sin silently to ourselves. You know our hearts, Lord. The things that we're going to confess, they've been burdening us. Those sins, those disappointments, those failures, those times we have stumbled in following you, those times we have given into sin. We're going to confess it, Lord, but we're going to confess all of our sin and ask for forgiveness at this time. Lord, all of our sins, we lay them at the foot of the cross and ask you for the sake of Jesus to forgive them and leave them behind in the empty tomb. It's in his name we pray this. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters in Christ, come to the altar where the Father's arms are open wide because he has put his son Jesus on the altar of the cross. And through his sacrifice, through his shed blood, through his innocent suffering and death, he has taken away your sin. And now he has risen from the dead, Christ is risen, and therefore you too, through faith in him, rise also to new life. So this is the grace that God shows us in Jesus Christ. Therefore I love announcing to you, your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I want you to share this love and peace and grace with those around you. Just say whatever you want to them. Just say, welcome, glad you're here. Turn to those around you. You can even, if you're with your spouse, give them a hug. Ooh, yes. <laughs> and then you may be seated. Good job, guys. As always, we got Rachel, we got Christian, who are quickly hurrying away because they don't want to... <laughs> And then, of course, we got Melissa and Owen up there. Owen doing double duty here. It's like half on the drums, half down here. So if any of you are looking to help out up there, sure, go for it. Just let me know. Uh, welcome to the 505 again. Uh, just if you haven't filled out the connection card, especially in person, please do that. And then if you don't have prayer requests, drop them off back in the offering baskets. Speaking of offering baskets, they're back there. Um, multiple options to give. We run this all the time uh, during our worship services. Just not as kind of a club over your head, but just as a reminder that this is a joy and a privilege because of everything that God has given you in Jesus Christ. You're now free to give to the mission ministry of St. John's Lutheran Church and School, and I appreciate it. God appreciates it. Everyone appreciates it. So thank you so much for that. Uh, just got a few quick announcements. Not much to announce. Um, so VBS registration and uh, opportunities uh, to volunteer are ongoing, but that is coming up. We're now at the end of June. Our VBS is at the end of July. 
uh, we got a lot of kids coming uh, last I heard and so um, you know if you want to help out in any way shape or form that you can much appreciated for that a um, couple things about the 505 so first of all tonight our 505 dinner is going to be at, at Palmer place uh, in downtown LaGrange so I hope you can make it to that next week there is no 505 dinner because there is no 505 next week, okay? There is no 505 next week. It is 4th of July weekend. Uh, we're gonna have a number of people out of town. And so we're just gonna take a nice little summer pause, go enjoy, still go bless, you know, the area that you live in. Um, and of course you are invited uh, the next day to our 930 uh, worship service at that time, um, invited to that. But then we're going to pick it back up again on July 9th, and our next 505 dinner is actually going to be at the Highland Queen. Uh, we've never been there uh, before, so um, we're going to go there. That's at 55th and Willow Springs Road. Um, nice little summer place. Uh, hopefully the weather will work out for that. I think that's it. All right. Well, we are continuing our series called Amazing Grace Revealed. Remember, <clears throat> this is all about going through the various scenes in the Gospel of Luke that are unique to Luke. And all of these little stories reveal God's amazing grace in Jesus Christ uh, for us and for all people. Um, and that's not only what the scene is about, but it's what the entire Gospel of Luke is about. In fact, it's really what the entire Bible is about. So last week our scene was uh, the uh, home of Simon the Pharisee and uh, the woman of the city and God's forgiveness, uh, grace and forgiveness. Tonight we're going to be looking at scene number two, which is from Luke chapter 10. Uh, verses 25 through 37, this is commonly uh, called the parable of the Good Samaritan. So it goes like this. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man go was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him. And whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. This is our reading for this evening. Pastor Mark, you want to come on up and unpack that for us? New York City mailman was shot by a sniper. He crawled into the office Bible or the office building lobby and he was ordered to leave the lobby because he was dripping blood on the lobby floor. In Oklahoma City, a woman was starting to give birth on a city sidewalk. People walked right past her 
A nearby hotel refused to even give her a blanket. In Dayton, Ohio, a dozen people watch as a car crashed into the, into the Miami River. They watched indifferently as the woman got out of the car. She stood on top of the car roof and she screamed that she could not swim. No one helped her and the woman drowned. True story. However, there's the other side of the coin. In 1982, on a terribly cold day, an airplane crashed into the Washington DC's 14th Street Bridge and then it landed into the Potomac River. Many of you might remember this story. Most of the passengers died when it hit that bridge. However, several passengers were thrown into that very icy river. A helicopter eventually came and it dropped down a rope ladder, but it could only hold one person at a time. There was one lady in the water who was struggling to grab this ladder. Both her arms were broken and she was frozen and she could not hang on and it looked like she was going to drown. People on the bridge were shouting down encouragement to her, but then good Samaritan Lenny Skutnik broke through the police barricade. He jumped into the river, he dove in, he found the lady and he dragged her to shore. Otherwise, she would have drowned. He was a hero. We assumed that Lenny Skutnik had heard the story of the Good Samaritan. I mean, who hasn't? Atheists who have nothing to do with God have heard the story of the Good Samaritan. It is arguably the best known story of Jesus. For some reason, St. Luke is the only gospel writer to tell of the story. St. Luke begins with a lawyer trying to test Jesus. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And in true Jesus fashion, he answers this question with another question. What is written in the law? And he answers, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your strength, and your mind, and love yourself as your, love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replies. Do this and you will live. Now, this was an easy answer. Any good Jew at that time would be able to answer that question. But now it changes. The next verse, verse 29, he says, it says he wanted to justify himself. Now, don't you just love that phrase, wanted to justify himself. The expert in the law knew full well what the Jewish law required, to love God and love your neighbor. But he also knew that he had not kept the law perfectly. And so what does the lawyer do? He does what you and I often do all the time. He wants to justify himself. Think about it. You are stopped at a stoplight and here comes a homeless man begging for money. He comes up to your window and you feel guilty, but then you try to justify it in your mind. Well, I can't give him money because he'll just use it for alcohol or drugs. And so you don't. We try to justify ourselves because we are all sinful creatures. In response, Jesus tells this story. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho where he was attacked by robbers. Now, everyone listening to Jesus' story would have known what was happening here. They knew this road. They, he puts it into a story where they could all relate. This dangerous road was very well known. It had a nickname, the Road of Blood. Its rough terrain and very large rocks gave the thieves a very good place to hide. Bible scholars estimate that there were 12,000 thieves who hid along this long road. Jesus tells us that they stripped him of his clothes, they beat him senseless, and just left him there in his own pool of blood. We know nothing about the man. We assume that he was a Jew, but we also know that he's going to die if someone doesn't help him. The story breaks into two parts. Here's the first part. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other, other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. The priest was on his way back down the mountain to Jericho, where many of these, of these priests lived. They would go to Jerusalem for a two-week assignment, and then they would return back to Jericho and live in their home. In this story, 
it starts with great optimism. This is a holy man, a righteous man, a religious man. Surely this man will stop and help. But when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. He saw him, and he did nothing. The priest had a special problem. This man was unconscious. He was naked. There was no way to tell whether he was a Gentile or a Jew. Furthermore, this man could have been dead. If the priest touched a dead man, he would have to go back to Jerusalem and begin a week-long cleansing ritual. He would have to be away from his family, and he would have to start a quarantine process, which we all know about, don't we? In addition, if there were other robbers around, they might rob him too. Maybe it's better just to keep on walking. Besides, who's going to know? Then a Levite comes by, an assistant to the priest. He does the same exact thing. He goes on by. Who's going to know? Both of these men, when they saw the man, they passed by on the other side. Amazingly, these religious people who had just left church passed by on the other side because they didn't want to get involved. And in a very subtle way, Jesus illustrates something about this priest and this Levite. He shows that they were really no better than the thieves who robbed this man. You can be a thief in two different ways. You can take something that does not belong to you, or you can keep something that belongs to someone else. Proverbs 3, 27 says, quote, Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to do it. Or James 4, 17. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is a sin. Strong words, don't you think? They didn't beat up the man and leave him for dead. The problem was what they didn't do. The priest and the Levite were bad neighbors because they refused to be a good neighbor. And for those in the crowd listening to this story, there's still hope. All right, that's the first part, but now where's the second part? It must include some good Jew who's going to help this man then gives, Jesus gives them the punchline. And you can hear the people's reaction all the way down to Egypt. I'm sure there was an audible gasp when he heard this. But a Samaritan came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. <laughs> Think of the irony here. In Jesus' day, the only good Samaritan was a dead Samaritan. No class of people was hated more by the Jews than Samaritans. Here they had intermingled with foreigners during the Babylon captivity. This made them unclean. Samar uh, Samaritans were publicly cursed in the Jewish synagogue. Prayers would be offered every day in that synagogue, begging, begging God to keep them out of heaven. And here's how much they really hated each other. When the Jews came back from captivity, they tried to rebuild the Jewish temple. The Samaritans would harass them by throwing dead pigs over the temple wall into the construction zone. This would contaminate and defile the ground, setting back construction a couple of weeks in order to clean things up. Now, as an ordained minister, I can assure you that this is not a good way to promote positive ecumenical relations. They were detested, despised, abhorred. And now Jesus makes this Samaritan into a Lenny Skutnik. Just imagine how this lawyer and his Pharisee buddies are feeling as they continue to listen to this galling story. Note here how Jesus frames this story. When the priest saw the man, he passed by on the other side. When the Levite saw the man, he passed by on the other side. Those two sentences are nearly identical. But the, but the Samaritan, when he saw him, he took pity on him. The King James says it this way, he had compassion on him. It reads, he went to him and bound up his wounds, 
pouring on oil and wine. And then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two de denarii and gave them to the innkeeper saying, take care of him. And whatever more you spend, I will, I will repay you when I come back. What this good Samaritan does is nothing short of amazing. He uses all of his available resources, oil, wine, his own personal clothing, his animal, time, energy, a whole lot of money to give this man the best care available. And then he risks his own life taking this wounded man to an inn in the Jewish territory. Now, think about this now. A Samaritan can't just dump a Jew to the ground as you enter that Jewish town and then right away. Legally, he could be held responsible. To top it off, this Samaritan gives the innkeeper enough money to take care of him for three weeks. And then he promises to come back and he will repay him for whatever he owes. Now, this part of the story is important because if any person that could not pay a bill could be sold as a slave in order to get full payment for a debt. Wow. And then the story ends. Note here that Jesus does not really end the story. We still don't know how it ends. But then he asks this lawyer, out of these, out of these three, who was the neighbor? Note here that the lawyer can't even say his name. He says, he only says, the one who showed mercy. The, con the concept of a good Samaritan was so abhorrent that he can't even say the word Samaritan. And in this story, Jesus is telling us to help people with compassion. However, it's much more than that. The whole point of the story is to answer this question. Who's your neighbor? Jesus says that there are no limits to the neighborhood of the kingdom of God. However, in the past hundred years, different religious, religious factions have told us that God, God is the father of everyone. And we have this universal brotherhood. No, we don't. We don't. That's wrong. We do not have a universal brotherhood. In the New Testament, the brotherhood is made up of those who are in Jesus Christ. John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The only way we enter into this brotherhood is through adoption. And people who, do not, who don't believe in Jesus are not in this brotherhood. However, there is a universal neighborhood. Every human being created by God is your neighbor, and you are called to love every human being. And that's really a radical thought, don't you think? That's a challenge to every person sitting here. And here's the final lesson to this story. Let's make this personal. You and I are sinful creatures. Because of your sinful nature, you are laying there, beaten up on that dirty road, the road of blood. Picture yourself ly lying there in your own pool of blood which surrounds you. You cannot help yourself. You are going to die. Now, picture the two people that are closest to you in your life. Maybe your spouse, your mom, your mom and dad, a sibling, a very trusted friend. And here they are walking by you, and they see you lying there in your own sinful condition. Can they help you? No, they can't. They have the same sinful condition as you, and so they have to pass you by. But now picture the Good Samaritan, Jesus Christ, who sees you lying there, and because of his perfect nature, he's the only one who can help you. He stoops down, and he binds up all your wounds. He picks you up because he has this tremendous compassion for you. And that's what happened on Good Friday. 
he took, our, he took our punishment because of his great compassion for you. This is amazing grace. We receive something we do not deserve. He has every right to just pass you by because you are a lost and you are a condemned creature. But because he has shown mercy to us, we need to show compassion to all because in Jesus, no one is excluded from this compassion. He takes us out of our own clothes and he puts on his own clothes of Christ's righteousness. Thank God that he did not pass you by. And he truly is the Good Samaritan. Amen. Well, as we're waiting for the, uh, our musicians to come on up here for our next song, let's go to our Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, that's exactly where we were, dead by the side of the road. And we did not deserve in any way, shape, or form to have you help us because of our sinfulness. We were dead in our sins and trespasses. And yet out of great compassion, you came to us. You showed great grace to us. You were so good to us. And all of that was shown by dying for our sin, by being beaten by those who were in charge of you and by being left for dead on the cross where you did die, Lord, for all of us. But this was to bind up our sinful wounds. And you did this, Lord, to lead us to our heavenly home. And you will come again one day, Lord, in order to to raise us up to full life in you at that time where there will be no more sin, no more death, Lord. Until that time, Lord, may we not try to justify ourselves, but instead trust in you for full righteousness. And Lord God, may this faith in your goodness, in your grace, in your forgiveness and love and compassion toward us, may that be energized in love toward others, Lord. A love that shows compassion to those in need, but especially, Lord, a love that shows compassion to sinners, those who are dead in their sins and trespasses, those who do not trust in you, Lord Jesus. Use us to love them, and especially to point to you, the good Samaritan who has compassion on them. Thank you so much, Lord, for the goodness that God shows us in your compassion to us. It's in your name we pray this. Amen.
of the goodness of God. In all my life you have been faithful. In all my life you have been so, so Of the goodness of God, I love your voice, and you have led me through the fire in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend, and I have lived. In the goodness of God. In all my life you have been faithful. In all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness. Your goodness is running out, it's running out to me. Your goodness is running out, it's running out to me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running out, it's running out to me. Your goodness is running out. Your goodness is running out, it's running out to me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running out, it's running out to me. And all my life you have been faithful. So good with every breath that I am able, and I will sing of the goodness of God. In all my life, you have been faithful, and all my life, you have been so, so. of the goodness of God and I will sing of the goodness of God I will sing of the goodness of God Are there any prayer requests that anyone has this time? Oh, yep, we got one prayer request. Thank you. All right, let's stand for prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, once again, we come before your throne of grace and lift up our intercessions, our thanksgivings, and other supplications, Lord. Um, if there are those who are sick, Lord, uh, in any way, shape, or form, we pray for healing, Lord. And any of those who have lost loved ones, Lord, comfort them. Comfort them with the hope that is the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord God, uh, we also lift up in prayer uh, for Pastor Brian Stolorzik and family. Uh, they have suffered extensive damage to their home through heavy rains down in Florida. 
plus they are going through other struggles at this time. Lord God, we pray for safety, health, comfort, and peace for them in the days and weeks uh, ahead. We also lift up in prayer on behalf of Ken Raylan Miller. Uh, pray for their daughter Rachel, who is having some complications with COVID, Lord. Lord God, heal her according to your good and gracious will. Get her back to full health, Lord. Be with everyone that is suffering from this virus, Lord, and uh, get rid of this virus, Lord, all according to your power and your mighty will, Lord. Lord God, we also lift up those, our public servants, our leaders, our police, our firefighters, our first responders, our military. We lift them up, Lord. Uh, we just ask for wisdom uh, in making decisions. We ask for protection, Lord, and we thank you for their service, Lord. Lord God, we lift up our nation that we live in, the United States of America, although at this time, Lord, United seems to be just an ideal, Lord. Um, especially with a recent ruling that came down from the Supreme Court uh, just recently, Lord, that revealed this deep divide, Lord. And yes, maybe even this deep divide among the members of the body of Christ. Lord God, we're going to pray for two things. One is that we pray for those who would seek to do further violence, Lord, to life. All because they're angry and upset. Lord God, prevent it. Uh, protect those who are in harm's way. But the second thing, Lord, is that we pray for your people and we pray that we are known not for what we are against, but for. We are for life. We are for all life, Lord, from the moment of conception all the way to that final breath being drawn. And we are for life because you are Lord for life. You created life. You redeemed life through your son, Jesus Christ, through his death and his resurrection. You sanctify life, Lord, through your Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, as we engage in this very divisive time, Lord God, give us calm, give us patience, give us peace, but especially give us the words to say that we are for life, all life, and may we love our neighbors, Lord, and have compassion on everyone. Lord God, we lift up other prayer, petitions, intercessions, thanksgivings, anything else that are on our hearts at this time. We lift them up, Lord, in the name of Jesus, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. In the same vein, I'm going to ask you to confess your faith. I'm going to ask you, do you believe in God the Father? Do you believe in God the Son? And do you believe in God the Holy Spirit? The God that has compassion on you. The God that has created you. That has redeemed you through Jesus Christ, through his innocent suffering and death through his shed blood and his glorious resurrection, and that God sanctifies you 
in your baptism through the power of the Holy Spirit, giving you forgiveness of sin. And that will lead to resurrection and eternal life. If so, then answer, I do believe. I do believe. Then receive the blessing of that same God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. All right. Don't forget, we're going to head to uh, Palmer Place after this. Uh, if you can make it, it's just an invitation. Uh, if you're in the LaGrange area watching us online, you're certainly invited to come and join us. Uh, just a reminder, next week we will not have a 505 service or 505 dinner. You are invited to come to our 930 Sunday uh, service where we are continuing our Amazing Grace Revealed by looking at grace that seeks the lost. We're going to be looking at uh, Luke 15, a wonderful, incredible chapter. And I think that's it. I think that's all we've got. You know what? We're going to sing uh, that song that uh, band sang at the very beginning of the service, Give Us Your Heart. And that's our prayer, is that you are sent out to share the love of Jesus Christ with your neighbor. And that means everyone. Everyone have a blessed evening in the Lord.
Dios, 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 Dios,